what we're really interested in is what is God speaking to us, what is he saying to us as we engage in looking into his word. And so we're, uh, we're much more interested in that. And we understand that God ordained, that it was part of his plan, that he would take things like this, events that happened years ago, and use this method, and God decided that, we didn't decide it, use this method to actually communicate with us now, in the present, where we are in this situation. And so we approach it in that particular way. Just to recap, we looked at chapter 1 uh, last week, uh, talking about the, the death of Saul, and saw a number of things, the balance between the openness of heart, the readiness to receive, but the importance of hearing God. The balance between the importance of instant forgiveness, but the recognition that trust has to build, and it builds on the basis always of what God is saying. We listen to God more than to anything else. We saw that gaining man's permission is not the same as gaining God's permission. and Therefore, we want to see what God says because that can uh, contradict and rightly contradict anything else. And then we saw stuff about the honoring of the uh, office and the balance between uh, covering up unrighteousness and yet honoring uh, the servants of God and the work of God. So, an interesting time. Remember, I also said as we went through this series, good idea to kind of read ahead. That would give you the opportunity to share in any particular uh, thoughts, ideas, inspirations, things that you feel God says as we go through and ask you to either pass them to Debbie or to communicate with me uh, directly by email so that we have the benefit of corporately looking at this together. So we come now uh, to chapter 2 and I'm not going to tell you where but at some point it's going to be over to you. And that's a little bit sneaky because it means you've got a kind of Listen, because you don't know when it's suddenly going to be over to you. And that's you know, a little trick of the trade, you know? Yeah. That would be a little bit sneaky. All right, so let's read a little bit. And because we're looking more to see what God is saying, don't guarantee to go through all the detail of every battle and who killed who and so on and so forth. That's partly because I get a bit bored with that and partly because, and mostly because, we really want to just pick up what what God is saying. But of course you would already read that and understand those bits so I can skip those bits and we all are laughing. All right, so 2 Samuel chapter 2, in the course of time David inquired of the Lord, uh, in no great hurry in the course of time, in God's timing, we covered that last week, inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, go up. David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron <coughs> and its towns. Then the men of Judah <coughs> came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. When David was told that it was the men of Jabesh-Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead to say to them, The Lord bless you for showing this kindness to Saul, your master, by burying him. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you have done this. Now then, be strong and brave, for Saul, your master, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Maybe we'll pause there before we get into the, into the sort of gory bits um, <clears throat> of battle. So what do we see? <clears throat> what do we learn uh, initially? Well, 
uh, following on from what we were talking about last week, absolutely vital, he inquired of the Lord. Uh, he didn't make the decision himself, and he could have done. Uh, he had quite a lot of experience of taking land, quite a lot of experience of battle, uh, quite a lot of uh, background of success, but he remained in that place of um, dependency upon God, that place where God always wants us to be, where we are never in the place where we become people who could do it, not what we call never the able man concept, never in that place I can do this, living in the revelation uh, of poverty of spirit. The uh, Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And remember, poor in spirit, it's nothing to do with how much money you've got. It's to do with living in the revelation that basically uh, we have nothing outside of what God gives us that commends us to God, that commends us to himself. He set his love upon us. He placed his love within us. He chose us. That basically... We live in this, in this sense of, of vulnerability before God, dependency on God, and never in a kind of able man concept, but always on the basis of uh, poverty, the revelation of poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The man who says, I can do nothing, even though I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. An important position to be in. Why is that an important position? Because it keeps us in that place of inquiring of the Lord. It delivers us from the idea that I can do this without you. Remember, we believe that God calls us to live by his grace. Uh, the grace of the Lord, uh, Hebrews 4.16, is strength to help in time of need. Well, if we live with the revelation of poverty of spirit, when do we need help? All the time. All the time we're dependent upon him. All the time we're able to uh, draw from him and receive from him. So he's inquiring of the Lord. Uh, he's not assuming, he's not snatching uh, kingship. He knows that that's coming and indeed declares that in the last verse that we read. But I want us to pick up something I think is very important here. He asks two questions. We've got the answer to the first one. What shall I do? Shall I go up? Yes, go up. Okay, right, I'm on my way. But he doesn't. He asks a second question. And you know, I think this is where sometimes we miss it. We miss out. Because we get the answer to the first question, okay, I'm on my way. i I'm, I'm, I'm got the word. But there's a second question. And the second question was very important. And I think we can see some of this uh, through Scripture. The importance of that ongoing dependency, the willingness, last week we talked about knowing God's mind and his moment, knowing the direction and knowing the timing. And so critical that we actually are asking like the second question. So where? Okay, go to Hebron. He gets the answer. And where we fail to do that, I think sometimes, it's not in the first question. I think sometimes we get, we get ourselves into a bit of a, a state because we got the answer. We got the word. And, uh, but we didn't ask the second question or the third, or the fourth, retain that dependency so we actually live as those who are led constantly by his spirit. You see, in this, in this gospel of grace that we live under, let me just remind you, the gospel of grace is the fact, as I've just said, that we can't do anything can't actually earn any body points with God. Uh, we can't earn righteousness. In fact, uh, the only thing we can earn, uh, wages, the wages of sin is death. 
So that's not a good way to go. Basically, we can't earn anything. I am what I am by the grace of the Lord. It was God who set his love upon me. It was God that drew me to himself. So, if I live in the reality of that, I have to come to the conclusion that there's nothing that I can do to actually enhance my position. He's already accepted me. I am holy, the Bible tells me, because he is holy. I, I gain what he purchased for me. There's, no, there's nothing I can do. Which completely defeats the idea of religion, trying to do things to kind of get to God, and any form of religion, I count in that. Uh, there's no form of religion. Every form of religion basically contradicts what Christ has done for us on Calvary, because it's about what I need to do in order to get to God. So, the contradiction of religion, but it completely blows out of the water anything that, that sniffs of legalism. And you see, the problem is, if, if we say, somehow, my place with God is enhanced because of what I do, I'm basically saying, uh, Jesus, well done, Calvary, dying, rising again. Good job. Um, but just take the weight off your feet. Sit down for a bit, because I need to add to what you've done. I need to, and you can pick up whichever form of legalism you like. I grew up under all sorts of forms. Uh, we were, according to uh, what I grew up under, we were in deep sin last night. Why my wife enjoys dancing so much is because she believes still what she was taught. It's very sinful. <laughs> well, she doesn't quite believe that now. But I mean, any form of legalism is so dumb stupid. I mean, you encounter it in all sorts of places. But it's worse than stupid. Is basically saying, Jesus, nice try, not good enough. The gospel of grace is that he has done what we need to make us right with God. And it's our surrender to what God ordains his place should be that entitles, that brings us in to the benefit of what he has obtained for us. And what is that? He said, I have made him Lord, and everybody is to do that. That's the step. I turn from my rule of me to his rule of me, and I choose to do what he wants me to do, and I can do it by his power. He empowers me to live differently. I'm engaged in a supernatural walk, an ability to live from a different life source, an ability to not just be different on the outside, but to be, the Bible says, born again. Completely renewed. Something switched on that wasn't switched on before. And it's all because of what he's done. Not because of what I've done. It's about his grace. Now, that opens up a whole area because gone is the idea, come to Jesus, uh, and some of us, again, grew up under this gospel. You come to Jesus, um, he forgives your sins, gives you a ticket to heaven, and one day you go to be with him and walk on streets of gold and drink cups of milk and honey. As you know, I have no anticipation of that. I never yet have fancied a cup of milk and honey. It, it feels like a medicine. <clears throat> and as for walking on streets of gold, I've told you many times, you walk on a street of gold, you watch out, because I ain't going to be slowing down in my red Ferrari for any one of you. <laughs> you get ready to jump. No way. You go walk on streets. I've got my red Ferrari, man. <laughs> and petrol is free. <laughs> and there's no speed cameras. Oh, I'm really getting into it now, aren't I? You know, 
What was I talking about? <laughs> Petrol. <laughs> See, that's not the gospel. The gospel is about come to Jesus. He will, because he loves you, beat the snot out of you and cause you to be somebody different. Change you. And empower you to live differently. And then take you into partnership with him. Which is why he can say, Lord, shall I go up? And he gets an answer. Uh, and where shall I go? And he gets an answer. It's about a partnership. It's not about sitting there waiting for some blessed rapture to take place and trumpet to sound. It's about being engaged in living as God intended that we live. Living differently by his power. People who pray. People who engage. in Your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Now that is interesting. That is exciting. That is partnership with God. And so up he goes to Hebron. And he takes with him his wives. Good idea. Um, I mean, good idea to take your wife. I mean, then they had more than one, but we're not into that, all right? So... <laughs> I've made a firm decision to stick with the one that I've got. I've spent 40 years training her. I'm not going to give that up. You know. <laughs> Let me just touch on this, which is so close to the heart of God. He lists who goes with him. He doesn't talk just about the individual. He talks about the corporate. And one of the things that God has given us the privilege to do is to be expressing in truth and reality what he's really like. In other words, the corporate nature. I do not believe that it's possible to show what God is like without the corporate. God himself is corporate. He started off corporate. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And essentially, he wants a people. You cannot show what God is like on your own. The Bible says... You know, the degree to which we love God is the degree to which we love one another. We have to have the corporate expression. And that's why it's so critical. It's so critical for us to operate as a corporate group or as a family because that's a true representation of God. You can't do it by just attending meetings and sitting looking at the back of somebody's head for an hour and a half or two hours, and then saying, God bless you, and seeing them again the following week. That is not corporate. That is not fellowship. That is not what God intends. God intends a group of people that show what he's like by loving one another in the totality of life. That's why it's important that we rejoice together, weep together, pray together, go on holiday together. And have, a gr and have a great time. <laughs> Endure together. <laughs> I do want us to understand this. It's really important. Let's think, for example, uh, on the holiday, Tim and Michelle. Uh, they've left us. They've gone to Gloucestershire. So, we don't want anything to do with them anymore, do we? I don't know how they came to be on a holiday. They should have been banned. <laughs> See, we, we've got to understand, because we live in a world with what I call a denominational spirit. And it's nothing to do with whether it's a recognized denomination. It's an attitude that if somebody goes from us, for whatever reason, they become the enemy. 
that's divisive in the body of Christ. But it prevails. And some of you know about that and have experienced that. And that's not how it should be. Of course, when we come together as a company of people, I'm not just talking about the meeting. Basically, what we're doing, when we say, I believe that God is joining me to these people, what we're essentially saying, and we express it uh, in a variety of ways and in an ongoing sense, not because we do a foundation course. That helps us to understand the kind of things we can expect and the expectations of us, and it's a very good idea. But agreeing to be part of that covenant relationship, that outworking, that love relationship, which we potentially have with anybody that's living righteously, born again the Spirit of God, when we come together, we enter in, not to a new covenant, not to an additional covenant, but to be an expression of that which we potentially have with other born-again believers. That's a very significant thing. That's an expression of care. You know, when we give thanks for uh, the babies born amongst us, we express a commitment. That commitment is a very, very meaningful, serious thing. When we're expressing commitment to one to another, what we're saying is we are choosing under God to be part of the outworking of that covenant relationship, an expression of that covenant relationship that we could have with others, but God has given us the opportunity to have it together. That's very significant. We don't treat that lightly. We don't enter into that lightly. Neither are we trapped into something there. Because it has to be a heart thing. It can never be imposed. It can't have a structure that determines that. It's got to always be a heart thing. But you know, it's very true. If it's real, then there are benefits. First of all, there's got to be benefit of pastoral care. There's got to be a benefit of doing good to all men, especially to those of the household of faith. There's got to be benefits to it. So we don't stop loving someone because they feel to move on or God calls them somewhere else or whatever the case may be. They don't become the enemy. Equally, they can't be expressing that same level of commitment, covenant relationship because they're being moved to do that somewhere else. And it's important that we understand that this must never be tied up into a kind of structure thing, it's got to be a heart thing, but equally, it has to be real. It has to have meaningful expression. And it doesn't have to be when somebody goes, John Smith is uh, believing God is leading him elsewhere. He doesn't become an enemy. He's still a friend. I shall still uh, ridicule him and tease him, like I always have done, uh, and really enjoy it, and he really sets himself up for it. That doesn't change. You might hope it would change, but it will never change. Do you understand what I mean? The importance of corporate is important, but it's got to be genuine. We are not members of a club. We are not participators of an organization. We are joined together in a heart expression, a relationship, a love expression, uh, which is part and parcel of showing what God is like. So they went up, they went corporately according to the plan and purpose of God. Went to Hebron. Hebron was a kind of regional capital. David would have had a lot of friends there. Um, remember it was one of Caleb's special inheritance places. Uh, it's regarded as the city of priests. Uh, so clearly it wasn't sort of, God didn't sort of... Uh, close his eyes, get a map out, and see where, where his finger landed. I don't think God does that. I think God knows the end from the beginning. And he's purposeful in his choosing and strategic in it. We don't always understand the strategy. But it doesn't mean to say that it's not God's strategy. That's why we need to inquire of him. And so up they went together. And then he heard um, that the men of Jabesh... Gilead um, 
men of the same heart as him. Because remember what we learned last week, how he was uh, not at all happy with somebody not honoring Saul. And that same sense of, uh, you remember, weeping over the death. Uh, there's a, 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 an honoring, a recognition. And he found that these men from uh, Jabesh Gilead uh, were of the same heart. And he sent messengers to them, and sent a message. And he said, the Lord bless you uh, for um, showing this kindness to Saul, your master, by burying him. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you've done this. <coughs> it's always good to be in line with what God's doing. You know, God is more inclined to bless than to curse. God is more inclined to love than to hate. God is more inclined towards forgiveness, acceptance, love, than he is towards any of the alternatives to that. That's the kind of disposition that we would want and expect to have as our kind of default position uh, as we are servants of the Most High God and his representatives. And so uh, he seeks to honor them and show his gratitude, uh, again showing an attitude to have to the enemy. And then he does something uh, which I think is interesting and I want us to look at. He calls this blessing upon them. Uh, you know, there's a couple of things we need to bear in mind here that we are enabled by God to bless others, to actually be the action of it. We can ask God to do it. Lord, please bless Jeremy. Or it could be that God gives me the privilege of actually blessing him. Now, what do we mean by that? Blessing is something which somehow has a dividend which is greater than the actual event. I might give him um, five pounds. And what has he gained? Five pounds. But if out of that, he gains something like Alan was sharing with earlier on, God made provision for me. He suddenly receives something and his heart is warmed and quickened towards God. In other words, blessing is one of the ways in which we are demonstrating or, let me take it a little bit further, ministering the life of God. So God tells us to do something as part of our privilege, remember partnership, issue of holiness is sorted out, so we're no longer struggling to kind of get on the right side of God, we're now in partnership with him. And so we can, yes, ask God to bless as David did, but also do what David did and got involved in doing it. It may be one, it may be the other, sometimes it can be both. But we're talking about operating, doing something that God prompts us to do, which then carries with it a special dividend that causes somebody to be encouraged. That's another word for it. To be built up in the faith. That's what God's given us to do. Heck of a lot better than cursing, isn't it? Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, miserable so-and-so. If you just go around, mm, and like that. Oh, they shouldn't do that. You know, it's kind of, but to go bring in blessing, bring in light and life and joy into a situation, something that God calls us to do, can be expressed in serving, in all sorts of kindness, in care, in sacrifice, in thoughtfulness, in interest, and in love. All of things which God gives us to do one to another. When we were looking at this, Jamie told me uh, a story which was unusual, but I thought interesting. When he uh, had his year away, part of the time he was in Trinidad. And while he was there, one of the people there, was it Andre? Called Andre. Um, 
really looked after him well. Was that what he did? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, for him, obviously, for Andre, there's a special reward in heaven because he was looking after mum's youngest. I mean, you know, you do that and you've got to get a reward from God, haven't you? you know? Tough on the other two. Um, but he, he wanted to recognise that and didn't really have the means or how to do it. But he sought God and God gave him to pray prophetically that Andre's team would, was it win the league or, and get promotion? Was he in a football team? He'd get a job promotion and he played in a football team. And the football team he played in would win the, win the whatever it was, yeah. And a few months later, he got a call from him to say, thank you for that. It was a real blessing. I got the promotion and my football team won the league. I thought, well, that's, that's an unusual thing. Uh, but isn't God the God of the unusual? As well as the usual, God of the unusual. Blessing. Romans 12 says, Bless those that persecute you. Luke 6, Bless those that curse you. Basically talking about God enabling us, a supernatural people, to operate in the opposite spirit that we discover, that people come against us. Somebody comes with a, a kind of um, contentious spirit, we can do what the Bible says, a soft answer turns away wrath. What God calls us to do. Jesus went about doing good. Acts chapter 10. He called to build up and not tear down. Intriguingly, let's see if I've got this. This is one of the scriptures I, I really like. I find intriguing. Think about it in the context of blessing. Let me just read this to you. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power, listen carefully, because it's not what you think it says, and that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. What a mandate. That he, by his power, might fulfill every good purpose of yours. And every act prompted by your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I purpose to do this. And God fulfills it by his power and adds in his good stuff, stuff of blessing. What a remarkable thing to walk around and God backing up my plan with his blessing, with his power. You know, that's a place of humility, not a place of arrogance that I might walk before a holy God to such a way that he would give me things to do or that he would even allow me to plan and then he fulfill that plan by his power. I mean, what a God. And I'm just something that he created and he's prepared to do that. We're called to build up, not to tear down. So we're not talking, blessing's not something necessarily earned <coughs> or even deserved. In fact, think about it a moment. It's the very opposite of the world we live in. My rights, what I'm due, or the world of entertainment, whether it be popular novels or many films where my right to revenge justifies anything and everything. Okay, you ready? If the person next to you is sleeping gently, 
just wake them gently. It's not nice to be woken up suddenly. All right? What experience do you have of being blessed? And what impact did it have? Little groups, because that helps you to kind of engage and stimulate one another. Just small groups, four or five, no more, because otherwise you can't all participate. What experience could you recount? What experience do you have of being blessed? And what impact did it have? Now, if you're visiting or here for the first time and you don't feel to participate, that's perfectly okay. Nobody has to, all right? If blessing is vital, is part of what God's given us to do, one to another, is part of God's provision for us, and um, it has such a positive impact, um, what would restrict us either to bless others or to be blessed? Just take a moment or two on that, just two minutes on that. What restricts us to bless or to be blessed? All I wanted us to get to was this. It's in the plan of God and in what God has given us an ability to bless one another and to call his blessing upon. We are actually empowered supernaturally to bless. When we talk about being a company of God's people, there's a lot of opportunity not only to bless one another, but to also be a blessing to those we come into contact with. Minister that which causes people to be some way built up in God. Yeah?